a humanoid of the canine branch, this tarnished lives every day looking forward as only dreams remain of his past, flashes that come and go in the night, an academy student crying, a silvery tear and a golden egg. The rest is fog and walking through it brought him into the lands between. Faithless and lacking any intellect, his life is driven by instinct and the will to survive. Faint glimmers of gold act as his guide and the incredible capacity of adaptation as his greatest weapon. Reach into the endless fight, tooth and claw with wild heart. This is a quality arcane build that effectively focuses on three different stats in order to combine versatility, resourcefulness, and freedom, giving players the ability to express themselves as best as possible through the use of many different strategies or playstyles, all on the same character. Big weapons, fast weapons, bleed, poison, tanks, glass cannons, large shields, small shields, or no shields, this build can do it all. Whether you are not sure what you want to try next, or you are simply looking for some flexibility, this is the character for you. As always, we will review the stats of this build, the equipment that we use, and of course its applications within the game. Since there is a lot of ground to cover, I have created timestamps in the description of this video in order to make it easier to navigate the content and give you the opportunity to skip straight to the part that interests you the most. Let's get started. This is a PvE-focused build that works well in both solo and jolly cooperation. The main objective of this build is to give the player as many options as we can in order to effectively tackle every challenge that the game can present us while keeping the experience fresh and invigorating. Being able to have a full and complete range of options at all times will allow us to use any playstyle that we favor. It will allow us to experiment with new tools, and even switch between them at any point in time, in order to be able to use the best strategy available for each and every scenario. This will give us a character with a true nature of adaptation, and it will let you, my dear viewer, express yourself to the fullest potential by sticking to the style that suits you the most. The best part is that we do not have to sacrifice too much damage in order to do this, while all-rounder builds tend to be a bit weaker due to their nature, we are able to balance this through proper use of status effects, primarily bleed, and the ability to counterpick each enemy and boss in order to take advantage of their weaknesses. This build lets you go wild. This build lets you follow your heart. And, most importantly, this build lets you survive. To reach this objective, we will be running the following stats. Start the game as a Vagabond. This class is the most efficient to reach the required stat block for this build, allowing us to make use of every rune level possible to its maximum potential. As the primary focus of this build is PvE, I have chosen to base it on rune level 150. Finally, this is the stats block that you want to end up with. 60 Vigor, 10 Mind, 16 Endurance, 40 Strength, 40 Dexterity, 9 Intelligence, 9 Faith, and 45 Arcane. There are many ways to reach these stats. Level up however you feel comfortable. That being said, I do recommend that you take the following path. As soon as you are in the lands between, the first thing to do is get your Vigor to 20. Survivability is more important than damage when you're just starting out a character. The second priority will be to get Strength to 18, Dexterity to 17, and Endurance to 16. These levels will help you meet the requirements for Bloodhound's Fang, the carry weapon of the build, as well as give you some extra carry weight in order to be able to combine it with more efficient armor. The third priority is to get Vigor to 40. This will allow you to survive comfortably throughout the mid-game, letting you focus on your other stats. The fourth priority is to get Strength to 30 and Dexterity to 30. This will give you access to a lot of weapon choice, allowing you to shape your playthrough to follow any style you wish. That said, if you choose to continue using Bloodhound's Fang, then you will get a lot of damage scaling to increase your AR. The fifth priority is to get Arcane to 25. This will allow you to use most of the Arcane-based weapons that the game provides you, or to use your favorite weapons infused through the Blood Path. At this point, the bleed status effect will be both strong and efficient. The sixth priority is to top off Vigor at 60. 
This will put you at our required HP pool, granting you maximum security to withstand the hardest hitting attacks from the endgame enemies. The seventh priority is to bring Arcane to 45. This is the best point to stop when it comes to status effect application and it will give you the most optimized bleed buildup that we can get with any of our weapons. It will also help provide a slight damage increase to our most used armaments. The eighth and final priority is to bring strength to 40 and dexterity to 40. This will round out our physical stats and it will allow you to use the vast majority of weapons in the game. We will have many options for weapons that synergize through quality scaling when infused through the bleed path. So, why do we want these final stats? Allow me to explain. Vigor at 60 because I believe it is the perfect amount of health to survive the hardest hitting attacks of PvE. This will give us a total of 1,900 base HP. It is the second cap for the stat. Going any higher really diminishes your returns, and honestly, I never go any lower. Mind at 10 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. This build does not use any kind of spells, whether sorceries or incantations, so the only use for our FP is Ashes of War. This level is already good enough to use our best Ashes of War without any issues. There is no need to level this up. Endurance at 16 because it has been min-maxed in order to let the character use a wide variety of weapon options while still maintaining a medium load. Some setups will require the Great Jar's Arsenal Talisman, while others will not. Experimentation is key, and this level gives us a lot of leeway to find the perfect combination. Strength at 40 because it is the first primary stat for this build. It controls our weapon requirements and increases our damage. Dexterity at 40 because it is the second primary stat for this build. Much like strength, it controls our weapon requirements and it increases our damage. Intelligence at 9 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not need it at all in this build. Faith at 9 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not need it at all in this build. And finally, Arcane at 45 because it is the third primary stat our build uses. It controls the requirement to use some of the best weapons in the game, but it also increases our damage and, most importantly, it increases the status effect application of all weapons that have arcane scaling. This is the most important and most versatile stat in this build. Moving on to the equipment, this is the basic layout of the build. My dear viewer, I am sure that you are curious about how we are going to make a build with three primary stats actually be good. I am sure that you are asking how we can generate damage and advantages when our stats are spread so thin. These are good questions, and the answer is the best part, because you can do this in whatever way you wish. Starting with the armaments, the first thing to notice is that with this character I wanted to focus on a safe playstyle that combines a big shield with some fast rapier pokes. All of this had to fit into the feeling of the character while taking advantage of the fantastic status effect application that the build provides. For this reason, the main weapon that I like to use is the Anspur Rapier. This weapon has decent range and a very fast attack speed. Its special characteristic is that it has innate Scarlet Rot application. While this is not our main focus, it is still a good secondary source of damage. Now, the most important thing for this weapon is its blood infusion. In this way, the Ansper Rapier gets a bleed application and a quality type scaling of C scaling in both strength and dexterity. This provides the weapon with decent AR and a fantastic bleed effect through very fast attacks. Not only this, but the counterattack from this weapon is very quick and it provides us with many stance breaks in between the enemy offensive. All of this comes together for a fast and constant onslaught that is extremely oppressive for the enemy. As for the Ash of War, I chose to go with Kick. A very simple and to the point Ash of War that is very important to nullify enemy shields which can prove to be very annoying to deal with with a rapier. Overall, the Anspur Rapier gives us fast attacks that deal decent damage but inflict great status effects, turning simple stings into massive piercing strikes. In order to fit this turtle playstyle, we need a shield. 
In this build, I chose the Ant's Skull Plate. At first glance, this great shield is nothing special. It has 100% physical damage reduction and a decent guard boost that will allow us to block enemy attacks effectively. It also has a decently low weight, making it an effective shield to use. That said, it does have a very specific characteristic. This great shield has the highest hardness of all shields in the game. If you're not sure what hardness is, I go over this hidden stat in detail in another video. I will leave a link in the description in case you want to learn more about it. For now, the important information is that this shield is sturdier than all others, meaning that enemy attacks will bounce off of it much easier. With this great shield, even attacks from the largest enemies will have them recoiling, leaving them open for a big counterattack. Of course, this shield is the head of a gigantic ant, and that plays very well into the wild theme of the build. As a final note, the Ash of War of this shield is Shield Bash, and we are not able to change it. While I do not use this Ash of War very often, it does come in handy when you need to interrupt a very aggressive enemy. You will both block and attack at the same time, and that should earn you some breathing room. Now, this build also gets extreme use from its secondary armaments. First, the Misery Cord. Honestly, I use a pocket misery cord in most of my builds. The only reason why I would not run one is because I can't spare the weight for it. That being said, in this build, it is a very important part of the strategy. The superior hardness from the Ant's Cold's Plate will make most enemy attacks bounce right off, and this makes them easy prey to rapier counterattacks. The result is that we will be getting a lot of stance breaks, and this means a lot of repost critical attacks. The Misery Cord thrives in this situation, and the damage we will get from it is massive. In this case, I like to use the Lightning Misery Cord, but the stats of this build also lets you use a fire misery cord as well. The damage will be the same in both cases, so pick the element that you prefer. As for its Ash of War, I like to use Bloodhound Step. It is always a good idea to keep Bloodhound Step in your back pocket in order to traverse difficult terrain or to escape a sticky situation. I don't use it very often, but when it does come out, it is always a lifesaver it can completely nullify some of the game's most difficult attacks, and that is very valuable. The final armament I use is the Serpent Bow. This is a fantastic utility weapon and I grew fond of it very quickly. First of all, it is the main tool to pull enemies away from packs. While this build can take on multiple enemies at once, it is always better to take them on one by one. Fighting enemies one at a time really brings out the power and control of the shield and makes fights much easier. This is especially the case for larger enemies that tend to be stronger. The Serpent Bow provides us with an easy answer to divide them first and conquer them second. Still, the most useful characteristic of this bow is the incredible capacity that it has to inflict status effects. The first thing to say about this is the fact that this bow has arcane scaling. It is not much, just a D scaling, but it's still enough to increase the status effect application of all arrows that we shoot from it. Poison arrows, bleed arrows, and sleep arrows will all have increased status effect application through this bow. On top of this, the bow adds a flat 15 points of poison buildup on all arrows. The conclusion is simple. Use serpent arrows on this bow for almost immediate poison procs and then switch to bleed arrows for damage or sleep arrows for control in order to incapacitate enemies before they even get to you. Overall, this bow will not give you a lot of damage, but the strategic value that it brings to the table is impossible to ignore and it would be foolish to not take advantage of it. Shower enemies with status effects from afar and they will be extremely weakened by the time they reach you. With our weapons out of the way, let's talk about talismans. This build has two objectives when it comes to talismans, survivability and flexibility. We want to have a lot of HP and defense to survive some hits and we want to have a comfortable equip burden in order to be able to use many different armaments. For this reason, we are running the Erdtree Favor Plus 2, 
and the Crimson Amber Medallion plus two in order to get the HP values we want, the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman for increased defense, and the Great Jar's Arsenal in order to increase our equip burden. Being able to equip different types of armaments is extremely important to this build as the options it gives us are massive. As a result, this build will have a total of 2134 HP and a total of 38% physical damage absorption, which honestly is considerable. We can also take advantage of the extra equip burden to change back and forth between many different playstyles. That being said, as you will see later, there are other setups that we can take advantage of, all depending on what you, my dear viewer, prefer to do. Alright, let's talk about armor. In this game, armor is extremely important, and this is because in this game, armor is extremely good looking. Fashion Souls or Elden Bling, however you prefer to call it, is at an all-time high. For this build, I obviously wanted to play into a more bestial character, and this meant taking full advantage of the Black Wolf Mask, also known as Blight's Head. So, what you are seeing is the mentioned Black Wolf Mask, the Champion Pauldron, the Elden Lord Braces, and the Radon Greaves. I really like how the Bracers bring the whole fashion together, with the silver that matches the top, and the gold that matches the bottom. Of course, in order to play the beast, we will need some pigmentation modification. In this case, do your best to match the color of your character's skin to the mask. Most dark grays will work well. Also, don't forget to make your character as hairy as possible and color the hair white. After playing with it for a while, I believe that I reached a look that I really enjoyed. I might actually come back to this fashion later for a personal build. All in all, this armor setup gives us a total of 22% physical damage reduction that increases to 38% with the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, alongside a total of 43 poise. On its own, the fashion has pretty good defensive value that becomes even better with the talisman. As for the poise, it is fair, but not as useful as you would think. Having 51 poise is always better for PvE reasons. Overall, this fashion provides a fantastic look that also gives us plenty of defenses, bringing together both worlds very effectively. When it comes to the spirit summon that we will use for this build, I decided that the best choice is the Mimic. The Mimic is my favorite summon in the game, and it is probably the best summon in the game, and I use it for almost all of my builds. Being able to slap a second copy of my build down into the game is just too powerful and you can really see it in cases like this one. When we use a build that has high HP, high physical absorption and uses a great shield, the Mimic becomes an incredible tank that is truly difficult to defeat. It will draw aggro and it will stick to the map without letting go. You would have to be fighting a tremendous amount of enemies in order to finally see the Mimic go down. And this gives you time, space, and opportunity to deal massive damage to anything that the game is willing to throw at you. Still, with all of this said, the greatest value that the Mimic brings to the table is the amount of status effect application that it can put on the enemies. Whenever it comes to bleed, sleep, or poison, the Mimic will combine their own effects with yours. This combination will lead to maximum application of multiple status effects, for example, you can focus on sleeping the target while the Mimic procs bleed. Or the other way around, the Mimic can use sleeping pots to control the enemies while you keep pressure on them with poison and bleed. The synergy is almost limitless and the result is, quite frankly, tremendous. While it is true that this build works great as a lone wolf, the Mimic will always be the very best plus one that you can bring to the party. Everything that I have shown you so far in regards to equipment is my own personal way of playing this build. I am not saying that it is the best, and it is definitely not the only way to go about it. As mentioned many times before, one of the most important characteristics of this build is that you are able to play it however you want, using any style that suits you the best. And that is one of the greatest strengths that this character has. It can take advantage of many different tools in order to use the perfect one 
for every situation. You don't have to pick one or the other because this build has the power of everything. The first thing to take into consideration is that this build can take advantage of every single arcane based weapon in the game. This already presents many different options and playstyles to use. For example, you can use Rivers of Blood if you're looking for fire damage, or you can use Marai's Executioner's Greatsword if you need magic damage. Of course, this Greatsword and the Regalia of Aeocade are your best choices if you want to make a savage blender build. That said, if you want to be safer, you can use the Bloody Hellas, a large thrusting sword that can take advantage of the Great Shield that we are using. These are just some examples. We have not even begun to mention things like Nihil's fantastic area of effect or Reduvia's massive DPS output. As you can see, with just a few armaments, you are able to generate an extremely varied and versatile character. A true master of the arcane that takes advantage of maximum bleed output, but also has a few tricks up its sleeve. My dear viewer, please take a look at this list. This is a list of every single weapon in Elden Ring that this build cannot use. Let me say that again. If you see a weapon in this list, this build cannot run it. Why is this important? Well, because that means that every single weapon in the game that is not in this list, you can use effectively. If we are to quantify the amount of weapons in Elden Ring and then calculate which ones we can use and which ones we cannot, then you will get the information that you see on the screen. With this build, you can use 71% of all weapons in Elden Ring. That is over 200 options that you can choose from when making this character. When I mentioned the power of everything, this is exactly what I meant. With over 200 options, you are able to shape this build into whatever you want it to be. Whether you are looking for safety or aggression, range damage or close quarters combat, whether you want to be quick and nimble or slow and destructive, this character can do it all and it can do it in any way that you prefer. It is obvious to see that the possibilities are endless and we can spend hours going over all the different combinations that this build can provide. But seeing as how we don't have hours upon hours to discuss this, I will simply present you with a few examples of different setups that I like to use. Please do not hesitate to take them into consideration for your own inspiration. The first alternative setup that I want to show you is one that I like to call the Life Drain Berserker. Much like its name implies, this is an extremely aggressive setup that focuses on high damage, a lot of stance breaks, and some fantastic life drain to keep the character going. The main tools for this setup are the Great Horn Hammer, the Serpent God's Curved Sword, and the Taker's Cameo. Everything else is the same as before. These three tools that I mentioned all heal our character a small amount of HP per enemy that is defeated. All three of these effects stack together and with this exact setup and stats we get about 280 HP per enemy that we defeat. This is about 10% HP healed every single kill. This is important because it really increases the build's survivability and its capacity to save resources. That said, it also deals a lot of damage. The Great Horn Hammer that we are using is, of course, infused through the Blood Path, so we can take advantage of the massive bleed application. Not only that, this weapon gets a fantastic scaling of B scaling in strength and C scaling in dexterity with the Blood Infusion, making it a great quality weapon that fits our character perfectly. Finally, since it is a great hammer type weapon, we can take advantage of its strike type damage and its massive stance breaking capabilities. All of this leads to many critical attacks and incredible synergy that generates a very fun, dynamic and efficient playstyle. If you like to be aggressive, then this is what you're looking for. But I am sure that you, my dear viewer, are asking a very important question. What happens if the enemy is immune to bleed? The answer is quality occult scaling. Now, if you're not sure of what I mean with this quality occult scaling, I go over this concept in a separate video. 
If you want more information about it, there is a link in the description for you to check it out and learn more. That said, the important part is that certain weapons get a special damage scaling when infused down the occult path. They get very strong strength scaling as well as very strong arcane scaling. The result is a lot of damage perfect for those enemies that we cannot bleed to death. Here I show you two different setups depending on what type of player you are. On the top we have an occult great mace that I like to use with the Ashes of War, Cragblade or Wild Strikes. You can see that I have the Dagger Talisman in this setup and that is because Craigblade Great Mace completely decimates enemy stances and you can get almost immediate repost critical attacks for massive damage. If that were not enough, I also have the Pocket Misery Core to reach optimal amounts of repost damage. This is obviously a very aggressive setup that is useful against all enemies that do not bleed. On the other hand, we can also run a much safer playstyle with a Warped Axe and Ant Skull Plate combo. This is more similar to the basic setup I showed you before. These weapons will lean more into making enemies bounce off your shield and take advantage of this time with Warped Axe counterattacks. This weapon also takes advantage of the special quality of cold scaling. So, with the stat that this build uses, you will not be losing out on any damage. In fact, you will probably reach a much higher AR. That being said, there is no bleed on this setup either, so it continues to be only an alternative against those enemies that are immune to this status effect. With a calculator in hand, this is probably not a very strong build. The sheer reality is that jack of all trades or all rounder builds tend to be weaker. Damage is the general sacrifice that we need to make in order to generate so many options. That being said, this continues to be a very strong build because it provides opportunity to those players that have the knowledge of enemy weaknesses and to those players that are clever when it comes to finding good weapon combinations. The truth of the matter is that we do not need optimal damage if we are able to counterpick enemy weaknesses. We also get a lot of additional damage potential from bleed, making the difference in damage output much lesser in degree. And still, the most important aspect of this build is how incredibly fun it is to use. Being able to experiment with different weapons and strategies all on the same character is very useful and extremely entertaining. I believe that this character and this build have the capability of taking its massive potential and turning it into actual strength. I personally was very surprised as to how useful it was, and hopefully you will be too. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope that I get to see you on the next one.